I'd like to welcome back uh, Dr. Hilgoth um, just for a panel a brief panel discussion on these uh, topics. So anywhere is, is just fine. So um, I guess I would just like to ask a brief first question. Do you have different slides for different seasons? Like, is there a Belichick Gronkowski slide for the winter and the <laughs> fall? Or I have. I, that would be a good adapt adaptation. Yeah, we should adapt. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I'd like to sort of open the floor to any questions um, that are out there. Do we have? Uh, a lot of good stuff to think about and to talk about. Um, but let me, I guess, if I'm not seeing anybody right now, let me start off by asking, I think, since we are at a, at a college, a, a university here in the Boston area, the, the question of education comes up first, I think. And when I uh, look at some of the uh, topics that you both raised for discussion today, I see you know, very good stories, very stories that we all need to be passionate about. But they're complicated stories that, that need to be told. And sometimes they're not going to fit in a 140-character tweet or in a soundbite or, or, or anything else. But how do we, as scientists, as, as educators, as leaders of, 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 of sort of a non-traditional educational institutions such as New England Aquarium, how do we overcome that barrier of complexity and really trying to engage the public on a, on a broader level um, in, in, our di in our discussion. So I don't know if uh, Brian you want, or Nigella wanted to start um, off with that. I, I could make a, a first shot at this. I mean, I, you're absolutely right that, that there's no way we're going to reduce the complexity to a point where we're not going to bore people to tears or lose them. So I think a lot of this comes down to uh, helping people to develop a personal connection with their environment, especially kids, um, and teaching people to think critically. I mean, I think it's we can't throw a bunch of information at them, expect everyone to process it and make a decision based on that. It's, we have to teach them what do we do with that information if we give it to them and why do they care? And I suspect, I mean, this is your bailiwick, so I will pass it to you. Well, I think that was a very good summary. I think it's something we talk about at the aquarium all the time, and it's particularly in our exhibits and our programs and our lectures, is how, how do we engage the public? How do you get people to the next step, to want to really care about the oceans, to become ocean stewards, to get engaged on a deeper level. Um, and I think one of, one of the tricks is how to simplify very, very complex uh, scenarios uh, enough to still tell the truth about what's happening in a very fundamental way. And I think another thing that's really, really important is to get people talking about these issues. Rather than talking at them, actually encourage them to get engaged with their communities as well. Uh, find out who's doing similar work, find out who else is interested, and keep talking about it. It amazes me how little these issues are talked about in the public realm, mm. particularly climate change and other ocean issues. And so I think it, stop keeping this a secret and getting people to engage with each other. Um, you know, when they leave the aquarium, for me, a lot of the success is that they talk about these things to other people amongst their friends and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there something in the audience up there? Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for this presentation. I have two questions. Uh, one is, what is the response from other countries in terms of collaboration with the United States in efforts to address many of these problems that exist? I can, I can tackle that. Um, I've co-founded a group that we're calling Inshore that has um, about 12 different countries involved, and often from countries that politically have difficulty talking to one another. So we have, our group includes Israel, it includes Iraq, it includes Hong Kong, China, South Africa. Um, in each of those countries, we are developing pipelines to um, environmental officials and uh, people at the federal level who can enact change but may have a difficult time talking to their counterparts in other countries. And what we're, we're trying to do is run a series of meetings, we're, we're holding one in Hong Kong soon, where um, we establish this dialogue between scientists and policymakers, ask them what information do you need, what format do you need it in. Um, we in turn can tell them, look, really, this is what we're seeing. And hopefully what we'll do is, is we'll take what we learn in each country and move it to another one and build as we go along. So I think that to answer your question, um, this gets so lost in the politics so easily. Um, there's, there's an awful lot going on in the US right now that's under the radar. Um, but as long as it doesn't make it um, to a point where Congress has to argue about it, um, we're actually making really good progress. And that's where it tends to get, get stuck. <laughs> go figure. Um, and so I think a lot of this kind of more grassroots approach 
but making these connections to businesses, to um, uh, state, local, government, federal officials, um, and finding workarounds is a really good way to, to go. Uh, yes, I, I think you know we we do the same thing with our fellow um, aquariums around the world. Um, we work with a lot of scientists on a lot of projects at New England Aquarium. Um, in actually, I think it's up to 44 different countries which we, we connect with, um, and I learn an awful lot for each other. So as you say, at the grassroots level, it's happening. Yeah. Uh, se second question was um, in regard to the uh, Center for the Integration of Science and Industry here. Um, for students who are moving forward to degrees in finance and business, uh, it seems to be that there are some opportunities here in, the, um, in many industries for them to be involved in. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to mesh both the scientific and the business field together. And lastly, uh, the impact on the local fishermen, lobstermen, Maine this past winter was their boats were frozen in. They weren't able to, on a cost-effective basis, get out of the harvest of fish. So um, they're struggling financially to keep uh, their livelihoods going. And mm -hmm. I think um, education or information is going to be vital to them to understand the, the issue of um, availability of certain species, whether it be lobsters or fishing. Thank you very much. Thanks. Just to, to build on that last comment, I, I agree completely. Um, we, we have a number of, of economists um, in, our, in our group that were hired recently, um, including one named John Grabowski, who works um, with local fishers a, a lot. Um, and what he's found is that there's this post-traumatic stress syndrome in those families. I mean, it's an incredibly traumatic event to think of centuries of a lifestyle disappearing. And you're not going to fix that by <laughs> imposing rule on, on a group of people who traditionally don't like to have rules imposed on them. Um, it's got to be a dialogue. It's got to um, not just focus on the science, but also aspects of the lifestyle um, that they're going to want in order to, to keep moving forward. And so I think it's a great example of, of a dialogue that has to keep opening up that, that traditionally has had a lot of distrust in it. But I think, again, um, probably it's because it, it, most people don't care about scientists enough for us to be um, perceived as political. Um, we can make some headway because people aren't afraid to talk to us. Right. Up there. Uh, could you just elaborate on aquacultures a little bit more and like some specific examples? I saw like those tanks in the ocean or stuff like that. I didn't really know what they were though. Um, I, I think it was, yeah. Uh, yes, I often. I was showing um, a photo of where you've got actually got um, fish that are in the ocean in enclosures. Um, and some of those are very well run, some are not. And I think um, one, one of the things is that we can control um, a lot of what we do in the United States. We have actually very good regulations for sustainable um, aquaculture. Uh, we just need to encourage a lot more of it. Uh, a lot of uh, aquaculture is, I think it's actually over 90% of aquaculture in the world is actually um, small farmers, often in developing nations. And that's much harder to control um, and takes all sorts of forms. I mean, shrimp farming, for example, um, happens in, awful, in awful large parts of Asia in very small farms. Um, and these are all areas where we're struggling to um, find best practice and how we can help them move forward. Um, so there's, there's really aquaculture takes a lot of different forms for just about anything that you think you can grow in the ocean or whether you want to grow it in land, on land, which is maybe uses a lot more resources than actually growing to the ocean. Yeah. Do you want to add to that? No, I think that's, that's a good summary. Yeah. I think we'll be talking a little bit more about agriculture and their talks following the break. Um, but any other questions right now? Right down here. Hello? All right, that works. Um, so I just had a question in terms of big business. Um, so what suggestions would you guys have in terms of um, helping biz big business uh, take the initiative or more of an initiative in um, helping global climate, um, like betterment of the global climate promotion? Um, I could take a, a stab, and I work with a group called the Association of Climate Change Officers um, that's based on K Street in DC, and they have a lot of the Fortune 500 companies. Um, and what they do is they work with the sustainability officers in a number of those companies. And what's amazing is 
the level of influence or the wide diversity of influence that those officers have within the company. There are some that it's just lip service and, you know, oh yeah, we've got a sustainability officer, but no funds, no power. And in other cases, they're right at the top level. I mean, everything that company is, is trying to do is, is based on that. So, I mean, I think if we can have more of that, if we can have it in the, the DNA of a company that, um, that corporate responsibility includes sustainability, I, I think that's going to go a long way to, to making this happen. Thank you. Any more questions? One more question right here. I'm curious to uh, hear how you feel about the, so people who aren't working with climate change in a, like a marine setting, so people who are working with climate change, they're like, save the honeybees, like more inland. So do you find that there's a collaboration to, for mostly, or is it, at some point, do you find that they're taking away your funds? They're taking away the focus of where you think the focus needs to be. Do you, does, does my question um, make sense? Like, yeah. How do you prioritize different? Exactly. You know, like, do you feel collaboration mostly, or do you feel hmm. combative animosity between the science? Well, in, in my experience, there's an enormous amount of collaboration because there's really no fine line, you know, between ocean and, and terrestrial climate change. It's wildly connected and oceans are an extraordinarily important part of regulating climate change and climate in general. So um, I, in my experience, scientists, um, and I, I have a, quite a bit of experience working with climate scientists, and they are immensely collaborative, and a lot of um, ones that you'd expect to be only work on ocean climate change also work on terrestrial climate change, particularly in modelers. So, I, I'm sure you can, Brian, um, speak on the more sort of um, specific level. But. Yeah, so, so my perspective, scientists are mean. Um, <laughs> we really beat up on each other. Um, our, our jobs are to, I mean, I've seen people cry when they get reviews back from, from funding agencies. And so um, the level of collaboration that we see surrounding climate change is really unique. Um, I really laugh at these conspiracy theories that scientists around the world are colluding with one another when, you know, the, the, the road to the fortune and fame would be if somebody could show that climate change isn't happening or isn't due to, to humans. So um, I, I completely agree that, that this is something that um, we've really started to coalesce around. You know, you, we can't look at the ocean without looking at what happens on, on the land. I think NGOs have started to realize this. And so rather than competing with one another, they're starting to divvy up their, um, their areas of focus so that they're not wasting resources at that level. So I, I completely agree that on climate change, I think we've really come together in new ways, which is surprising because I you know, mean scientists are. <laughs> I'm nice. Well, these are really complex and integrated systems, and we really appreciate it. I think climate scientists are really trying to work together to really see how these things interact and play off of each other. And I think that's one of our big concerns is what are the feedbacks and what are the potential downstream effects of certain elements changing in, in each of our environmental systems. So with that uh, thought, I think what we're going to do right now is just take a brief, approximately 10 minute break so we can all stretch, um, maybe get a glass of water. Uh, we'll reconvene here for the second part of our panel in about 10 minutes. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank the panelists.